you so much, Marina, and thank you to Charity Village for inviting me to join everyone today. I'm delighted to be here to share some thinking and ideas on a topic that, frankly, I hold near and dear to my heart. Uh, the risk and opportunity landscape continues to evolve, and it's intensifying at a rate or speed not seen before. We can think of those big transformations underway that are societal, technological, work-related, that are having significant impact on people's lives. Now more than ever, charities and not-for-profit organizations need to be thinking about and managing a broad spectrum of risks and also harnessing the opportunities to make a difference in even more people's lives, to move that needle in the right direction, to help solve some of the big challenges of the day. For leaders and leadership teams, the question becomes then, how can we influence and support that important organizational debate and series of debates that need to be happening across our organizations about the possibilities to increase impact and reach in this time of rapid change and growing need in our communities? The timing is perfect. I mean, it's just right to evolve how we view and manage not only the threats or downsides, but also how we can be more intentional about harnessing the upside by exploring the many opportunities to leverage our unique assets and capabilities to bring about the kind of positive change we desire for our communities. So I have spent the larger part of my career contemplating two sides of the risk coin, both the threats and the opportunities, and how best to toggle the upside and downside of uncertainty, which is a capability that increasingly all organizations need today to survive and thrive in this rapidly changing landscape that we are all operating in. As a strategic risk and innovation leader for one of Canada's largest and most diverse charities, I have been blessed by the many opportunities I have had to apply risk and opportunity thinking, working alongside the, main, the many amazing leaders and supporters at our YMCA of Greater Toronto, and as well with YMCAs across the country and other organizations and leadership teams in the not-for-profit and public sectors and beyond. It takes some translating and tool-making and lots of teamwork. These are essential attributes for discovering productive, constructive ways to better understand and manage uncertainty. A few of these tools and some of my thinking I will be sharing with you all today in the hope that this may spark new and different kinds of conversations about uncertainty internally within your own organizations. So, I'll uh, spend a bit of time at the front end uh, setting some context, starting with why engaging in risk conversations matter even more today, especially for charities. To help establish a common understanding, I will touch on some key definitions and trends in risk management and enterprise risk management, and walk through the key steps in the uh, risk management process and uh, share a few examples along the way too. I also want to spend some time talking about the strategy and risk interplay. Frankly, as leaders, this is especially important for us. As we will see shortly, it's the strategic risks that tend to be the ones that matter the most. So I will spend some time sharing with you what strategic risk management, or SRM, and the upside activity might look like with a few examples as well there along with some techniques and attributes that will come in handy when working in this upside space. And with Marina's help, uh, I was thinking, Marina, we, we will make sure to leave some room partway through and at the end for any questions from the audience. So that's the lineup uh, I've planned for, uh, for this uh, webcast today. All right, well, there are obvious benefits we can easily rhyme off on why managing risks matters. Obviously, it is key for protecting our assets, including our people, buildings, and built environments, our ability to generate revenues, raise donations, and also it protects an organization's image. And on this point, I will, uh, I will come back to it a little, uh, a little later, or uh, very shortly in a moment, actually. Effectively managing risks or certainty or uncertainty also helps leaders and organizations achieve their key objectives and desired results. It enables leadership teams to understand the, the unique assets and capabilities uh, uh, in their organizations that should be leveraged to grow reach and impact. And returning to reputation and image, 
which is perhaps among our most valued assets as charities, risk management contributes significantly towards protecting and building on public trust, which is a license or legitimacy he uh, shared his needs, frankly, in order to continue serving uh, communities. So maintaining trust is so highly valuable, yet fragile, isn't it, when, when pro processes like risk management are not in place or just not uh, uh, working that well. So here, uh, uh, as a further word on a public trust, we see results from an annual uh, report called the Edelman Trust Barometer. It's an excellent source for understanding changes in trust levels across types of organizations or institutions, uh, including charities. We happen to be captured in the NGO group. Uh, and over recent years, we have seen a decline in trust levels, including in Canada, uh, dropping sharp at, sharply in 2017, as the results here are showing. Uh, with trust levels sitting in the neutral zone for the first time for, for NGOs, including charities in Canada. Happy to share, though, that results from the 2019 report just released uh, show trust levels moving back up, which is great. What is helpful about this 2017 snapshot, and why I like to refer to it is, because it includes a breakdown on trust building attributes and this, frankly, provides just some great insights for us on the areas and activities worth investing in to maintain and build trust, and includes activities like ethical business practices or sound employment practices, and how we create positive experiences for our people, or the focus on quality in our offerings and service delivery that goes a long way towards ensuring we do deliver on the promises made to those we serve and to our communities all great examples of risk response strategies that we will explore further a little later on. So to some uh, key definitions now, we see here that risk or uncertainty can be defined as the effect, and that can be good or bad, on an organization's objectives, its goals, whether at the program level or operational, or strategic at the organizational level. Or put another way, risk or uncertainty are events or things that can get in the way of or accelerate our ability to achieve the results we desire. The term risk management refers to an ongoing management process we use to understand and actively manage uncertainty. And enterprise risk management, or ERM, is the same thing applied across an entire organization and will cover the full spectrum of risks and opportunities that we will get to flesh out a bit more in a few minutes. First, though, for a bit of context on the current ERM landscape. Uh, the timing could not be better, frankly, for leaders of charities to join many others in building and enhancing their as shown here in survey findings from a few years ago that may have improved but only slightly since. There is still some room for enhancement. Although a majority of executives when surveyed reported increasing levels of risk and complexity they are dealing with today, only one in three indicated having a robust ERM process in place, and less than half were satisfied with the kind of risk information they were getting. And there was not much if any, risk linking at all when discussing strategy or strategy execution or implementation at the organizational level. So why should we be particularly concerned as leaders about strategy and strategic risks? Well, apparently, being able to manage strategic risks really does matter a lot. As shown here in share shock analysis conducted by CEB over a 10-year period, 86% of declines in share value were attributed to strategic risks materializing. Some examples of these, of these strategic risks include declining demand for a product or service or offering, or a competitive incursion, or a failed ma uh, merger, or poor integration. All of these are examples of strategic risks. While declines tied to operational risks, as we see here, 
are in a distant second place at 9% with legal or compliance risks and financial risks way further behind at 3 and 2% respectively. So we contract, contrast this snapshot uh, on the left side of the screen with what we see on the right side, which is where time is spent by executives, and we surface something interesting here. We see operational risks getting a healthy 42% uh, of attention and financial 39% of executive time spent on these areas, while only 6% of executive time is spent on strategic risks. So the obvious question then that, uh, that uh, arises, are we paying enough attention to the risks that matter most? Well, the answer is decidedly no. <laughs> So why is this? Might it be that strategic risks are somehow harder to focus on or wrap our arms around because by, by their very nature, they will take us into the future or unfamiliar or uncharted territory? Well, perhaps. And yet the same basic steps of the risk management process will still apply regardless of the type of risk being contemplated. Whether we are dealing with an operational or financial or compliance or strategic risk, the same questions apply. And these are, what can threaten or get in the way of or accelerate achieving the kind of results we desire? How bad or good can it get? And what do we agree to do about it? And how do we know that what we are doing is actually working? By asking these simple questions, we have automatically triggered the basic steps in the risk management process. And one of the central and critical benefits or payoff of doing this, this stuff well includes informed decision-making around resourcing. Really helps a leadership team to decide on and make sure that what matters most is getting the intention needed, be it in time of people, uh, uh, money, uh, uh, time, or processes. And when an organization excels in risk management, the experts have uh, confirmed that there is an additive value or premium of at least 25% or more that will flow. So for charities, this means that we will have gained a clear understanding of the key drivers of value. And that may be tied to resources, reputation, relevance, reach, or the four R's as we like to call it at the Y. And we are investing appropriately in those activities, most tightly linked with value. For example, investing in our talent, quality processes, member experiences, and minding the gaps to ensure we again deliver on our promises we make to our communities. So having covered some of the context, it helps to round out this background piece with a quick word on what a board an audit committee uh, will typically expect from a management team of a charity. Directors will want to know that management has a process in place to identify risks and that they are actively being managed on an ongoing basis. And that includes any emerging risks on the horizon that we should be aware of and preparing for. And directors also understand that no matter how effective uh, the management of risks may be, that unplanned or unexpected event will always happen. And so, a board and the audit committee, perhaps, will also want some assurance on a level of preparedness that, that exists in a charity. To know that when a crisis hits, there are protocols in place to escalate quick, quickly so that a management team can respond effectively to contain any impacts. Here quickly is an illustration of an escalation protocol from the YMC of Greater Toronto. A protocol, a protocol like this one ensures that any emergency event, when it happens, is escalated quickly to the right level within an organization so that resources and support may be freed up right away for a stronger, more effective, quality response to any crisis situation. This obviously also goes a long way towards protecting an organization's reputation and can even build on a charity's positioning and image, frankly, as a strong community resource that may be needed even more during times of crises. So, now moving into the risk management process and, and the steps that this process uh, uh, captures. Having uh, 
taken care already of uh, some of the background that uh, I hope uh, has been uh, helpful. Uh, let's walk through the basic steps of, uh, of risk management that I alluded to uh, earlier. There are several risk management standards and guidelines out there, and ISO 31000 is a popular one, as well as the COSO ERM framework and others. Both of these that I've mentioned have been recently revised and updated to incorporate links to strategy and uh, achieving results or performance. As we covered already, this is, this is key for organizational success and ongoing sustainability. So here we see the five steps involved in the risk management process. That is an iterative one. It begins with establishing the context within which risks and opportunities are being managed, which at a rolled up organizational level for a charity uh, would mean its objectives that are articulated in uh, annual operating and strategic plans. Next comes risk identification, identifying those key uncertainties to achieving shorter term annual plans or longer term strategic plan objectives and goals. And we assess these uh, risks in terms of uh, their significance or consequential impact as well as likelihood of occurring. Next, we determine a combination of measures or response efforts to treat or address or respond to the risk or the opportunity, followed by monitoring to see if chosen response strategies are working or if any adjustments are needed. And then the final step is communicating and reporting, which obviously will help a lot to foster a risk-aware culture and shared responsibility throughout the organization. <laughs> Here's another framework um, that I developed and evolved uh, over time at the YMCA that we call risk intelligence. It helps us ensure that our managers and leaders are applying a balanced approach, that the downside and upside risks are considered and understood and are actively being managed at the Y. We begin again by understanding the context within which uh, risks and opportunities are being managed. And that includes taking in the changing landscape and understanding the strategic risks that can come or flow uh, when responding too slow or too fast or not at all. As the framework suggests, managing risk then will start with uncovering the potential drivers and threats to value and this will inform response strategies, moving to the middle, uh, the middle row boxes there, that fuel activities closely linked with value enhancers or threats and with strategy and strategy implementation on the upside. Continuing on the upside, examples of response activity may include program development and innovation, extending into new markets, engaging in business or mission model or program model renewal to grow reach. For the downside, some examples of response measures may include efforts to attract and keep talent, or policy development and training, or investing in quality processes and training, crisis communications, and so on. And moving over to the uh, monitoring box on the right-hand side of the framework, we adjust what is not working or optimize and, and replicate what is in another part of the organization. These key steps and activities all help us obviously close any gaps and unlock a whole lot of organizational value. Um, so I've been mentioning the YMCA. Uh, this risk intelligence framework has proven to be very effective for us uh, in supporting an ambitious YMCA strategic plan that calls for increased access, bringing more quality programs to more people for healthier communities across the Greater Toronto Area. A bit about the YMCA of Greater Toronto, it is among Canada's oldest and most diverse charities with offerings that include what most people associate with the Y, the swim, gym and camp programs. And the Y though is much more. We're, we are the largest childcare provider, for example, in Canada, and the largest language assessment provider for newcomers settling in the GTA. 
Serving over half a million members annually, the Greater Toronto Y operates at over 440 locations, and that's made possible by the tremendous support and commitment of over 5,000 staff and 6,000 volunteers. So obviously, there is a lot of value that the YMCA is protecting and leveraging every day to make a difference in more people's lives. And understanding your own organizational context, of course, will be key when applying the risk management process in your charity. So, exploring uh, more closely each step in the risk management process now, when identifying key risks and opportunities, we again want to focus on the potential threats and opportunities to achieving key objectives. We touched a moment ago on a few possible examples of some threats to value or value enhancers. Other sources to consider are any trends for example, when an organization may have failed to realize value or when it was successful. And of course, we also consider any gaps or variances in expected results. When thinking about the types of risks and opportunities, these will typically fall under one of four areas. There are the strategic risks that I've been uh, mentioning uh, uh, a few times now that again impact strategy or how strategy is implemented. And these may include strategic initiatives and assets like a charity's brand and reputation or strategic alliances. There are also the operational risks that include people, buildings, equipment, processes, and so on. Then there are the uh, financial and related risks that include shifts in the economy, ability to generate revenue, raise funds, or interest rate fluctuations are some examples there. And compliance risks that include uh, uh, our compliance with statutes, legal obligations, external reporting requirements, policy, and so on. When talking about risks, I like to also remind folks that risks and opportunities do not exist alone in their own little bubbles. Rather, risks are constantly interacting with each other in a highly interconnected risk universe. Although this map that focuses on the top risk there, information technology, may look a bit messy. <laughs> One of the benefits we gain by understanding these risk interconnections is that it really helps inform uh, uh, decisions uh, around resourcing. You know, it provides clarity on the risk priorities and some reassurance in knowing that any additional resourcing we invest in to address a top risk will also obviously benefit many other risks given how interconnected the risk universe is. So, Marina, I'm, I'm thinking this feels like a natural pause point because uh, we've we've covered background, we've covered some some you know uh, foundational uh, definitions, steps in the risk management process, and I'm wondering if we are seeing any questions from the audience at this point. We we might want to take one or two now before I move on. Sure, Monica. Um, could you talk just a little bit about the main responsibility of the board when we're talking about enterprise risk management? Sure. Um, that that obviously will get defined uh, uh, in keeping with uh, um, governance uh, uh, within a within a charity. But typically, it's an oversight role, right? The board, and more often than not. The audit committee, that board committee, uh, will have uh, perhaps deeper uh, in, in interest and oversight uh, in ensuring that there is a risk management process alive and well in the organization. They don't necessarily have to see all of the details, just that a pro process exists, it's functioning, that uh, at least once a year or every quarter, management is reviewing the key threats and opportunities right to achieving um, stated or articulated objectives goals usually within an operating plan uh, 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 for a charity or uh, uh, longer term uh, objectives in a in a strategic plan 
there really is an oversight role, uh, Marina. That's great, Monica. And I'll throw one more question at you. Is there a difference between strategic risk management versus project risk management? Oh, that's a good question. So right away, uh, I can think of capital projects that obviously is a clear example of a strategic initiative, right, and, and, and strategic risk. Um, uh, depending on the nature of the project, it may be a strategic in, uh, initiative, and therefore you are, you are triggering uh, uh, that, that strategic uh, risk lens. But really, uh, more, more often than not, a project is about getting something across the finish line in the way we had hoped and desired, right, to realize the benefits uh, uh, we are after. And so the strategic risk um, mindset is going to be um, interested in or looking for ways to increase likelihood of success to get something across the finish line, to realize the full benefits uh, hoped for, whether it's technology transformation, uh, uh, a, new, a, new, a new program being developed, um, or a, a capital project. These are some examples of perhaps larger projects. Again, probably the lens you're going to be uh, applying. Obviously, uh, <laughs> flesh out any of the threats and spending probably more time on increasing likelihood of success of that project. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, uh, Monica. I think we can carry on. Okay, good Thank stuff. You. Good questions. There'll be time at the end for more. Okay, so moving right along then, and on to the upside. Um, frankly, it's the upside that get most of us up in the mornings, isn't it? So more on that strategic side of things. Some may say or ask me, well, I get the risk piece, you know, the threats. I understand that. But what does opportunity look like? You know, what's that opportunity landscape uh, like? Well, when contemplating the opportunity landscape, uh, we might think about it as a point of uh, intersection or, or overlap. And that is where our aspirations or the impact we desire and what our communities want or need and what we are especially good at, you know, those, those key capabilities all intersect. And the three to five-fold potential beyond that that uh, I've shown here in, uh, you know, water squiggle lines. That's how I would um, uh, come at uh, defining the opportunity landscape. Okay. When contemplating risks, I mentioned a moment ago also uh, something around uh, emerging risks. Um, uh, the board uh, will be uh, interested and, and wanting to see some satisfaction that what's emerging has also been contemplated by the uh, management team. So when contemplating risks, we want to think about not just the here and now, but also the risks on the horizon, those trends that could possibly impact our business or program or mission models and how we will operate in two or three years from now. We consider events or trends uh, we may be unprepared for that makes us vulnerable. Things like the rate or speed of change in preferences and choices uh, being made by people we serve and how prepared or resilient we are and how quickly we are able to adapt or evolve, which speaks to agility. That can apply not just at the organizational level, but also obviously at the individual, leader, and team levels too. I will touch more on this a little later. And here, uh, uh, we can see uh, the drawing on uh, external sources for great insight on risk trends that are emerging, right? Looking out into the external landscape. There are two very good sources I like to use, and I use them often. One is World Economic Forum Risk Report, 
uh, which each year publishes its uh, global risk report in January. And then there's the North Carolina State University uh, that uh, um, run a survey with Prativity, and they report results in November and December from their global survey uh, each year. We can see here the common themes, right, that may trigger meaningful discussion internally about an organization's preparedness, resiliency, or agility. And this we will touch on uh, again uh, further in a moment. Okay, so once organizational context has been considered and risks have been identified, we are ready to assess the risks. And to do so, we consider the significance or consequential impact of risks based on assessment criteria that may cover financial, health and safety, or reputational uh, impacts and considerations. We also consider the likelihood of the risk materializing, whether it's here and now in your face, or it's likely to occur once or twice in one year, or once every three years, and so on. For opportunities, the terminology will shift a bit, as we will want to think about the revenue or impact potential. How good can it get? and the re relevancy with our brand or, uh, sorry, with our um, strategy or um, our uh, level of capacity, right? Um, do we have or can we easily acquire the capabilities needed for success? At the organizational level then, leadership will want to focus their attention on the upper right-hand quadrant, the high impact, high likelihood risks as these, frankly, will constitute your top risks, right? Your major risks and opportunities. And to a cer certain extent, you'll want to extend your, 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 your consideration uh, to contemplating also the high impact, low likelihood risks in the upper left-hand quadrant to ensure a certain level of preparedness or that there's a contingency in place should a major natural disaster, for example, occur. When <clears throat> assessing risk, I like to keep in mind this play on words here. And it's a, you know, a simple reminder that often it's the stuff that is hard to quantify that can matter the most. So once risks and opportunities have been identified and assessed to determine your highest risk priorities, we are ready to address or respond to the risks and opportunities through a combination of response options we see here. Um, those response strategies that are proven most effective and that are most often uh, employed by organizations include paying attention to the value chain or program delivery and supply chains and ensuring levels of preparedness. And of course, having good employment and development practices to attract and keep employees and volunteers with the right fit, uh, training or investing in quality processes, and monitoring that includes good feedback mechanisms. All of these are proven response strategies worth investing in to address, control, or minimize the impact if a risk materializes, or eliminate the likelihood of a major risk materializing. And for opportunities, again, we'll switch up the, uh, the uh, uh, wording or terminology slightly by, by, by indicating that response options will, again, and we touched on this in the answer to one of the good questions, uh, Marina, response options will, uh, will focus on increasing likelihood of success. Uh, and some options uh, uh, may include investing in smart experiments, more innovation, applying strategy strengthening techniques, that we will touch on in a moment. So a quick word on a f the final step in the risk management process, uh, communicating and reporting. Here is a sample risk register to capture risks and opportunities uh, that uh, an organization will have identified. It includes risk definitions and ranking that's based on assessment scores, you know, likelihood, severity, and can also indicate any year-over-year -year change in, changes in risk level where you see that, that increasing, decreasing arrows uh, showing up in that column 
so you see movement of uh, of, of risk um, uh, compared to a prior year. As well, a register can highlight um, perhaps the top three to five response strategies or controls in place to address the major risk, along with calling out the designated member of the executive team responsible for oversight and periodic monitoring of a major risk. All right. Just doing a quick time check here. Uh, I'll take a few more minutes to now touch on those techniques and approaches I've, I've, I've promised I would. Uh, so we'll push on. Um, as these will be very helpful for building organizational capacity and risk management. Like um, many other big management processes, it really does help to chunk things down where, when, when you're getting started on a process like this. One approach is to start off by taking stock of the current state, and in the first phase, uh, you can see uh, we need to establish a common language, and that includes uh, defining what we mean by risk, which we covered earlier and then move into identifying and assessing the major risks to end up with a prioritized list and register uh, that can hold your key risks and opportunities as we have seen just now. A next phase, you know, a phase two might be to give some thought to a helpful framework so that everyone is on the same page along with defined roles that can include having a senior level risk champion to help coordinate and facilitate annual or, or quarterly assessments and uh, maintaining the register uh, or supporting risk reporting at an executive level and so on. We also touched earlier on some frameworks including ISO 31000 and, and, and the COSO framework that may be a useful uh, start. And then there's the third phase and here you might consider how, how you might want to embed risk thinking and opportunity thinking in other key planning processes that are happening, uh, like budgeting or new program development or a strategy and strategy development. So we'll spend uh, a few minutes here uh, touching on uh, some examples of risk and opportunity embedding. Here's an example of embedding risk thinking as part of the annual budgeting process at the Y, where each budget holder will indicate the top two to three risks and opportunities to achieving their budget and meeting their plan objectives. This chart is obviously easily folded into and can make and can be a part of a budget planning document or set of guidelines. It also is a powerful reminder of that shared responsibility and role that all managers have in managing risks and opportunities on a daily basis within their own program or functional support area. Okay. So, um, digging a little deeper into this uh, uh, strategy and risk linking, I started off earlier by mentioning the importance of linking risk with strategy and strategy implementation. And although strategic risks will often take us into uncharted territory, there are some useful approaches and techniques that can be very helpful that I would like to quickly uh, share with you. Strategic risk management, or the SRM process, is one that specifically shines the spotlight on risks and opportunities related to strategy. It helps leadership teams deal precisely with this kind of uncertainty that naturally, naturally is going to come with uh, venturing into the unknown. So SRM will help surface these uncertainties, including any flawed assumptions, and it uncovers possible options and triggers action to make a strategy stronger or increase the likelihood of success of a strategic initiative. Okay. Before sharing a few uh, sample tools, I would like to quickly comment on the true value of any good tool or framework, which is that common language uh, that it will provide to help generate a, a conversation frame a problem and surface some options that inevitably is going to lead to a chosen response that a leadership team can all agree on, which otherwise might not have been possible. I explore further how to navigate strategic uncertainty 
and a thought paper I wrote that is available free uh, to download from the RIMS or Risk Management Society website. And there is also an accompanying webcast available through WEMS, which I had the honor to do with the uh, perhaps the top strategy mind and thinker today, who is a Canadian, Roger Martin, if anyone is interested in learning more about the strategy and risk interplay. Okay, so some examples, tactical examples of uh, some, uh, some useful strategic risk tools. Here is an early tool I designed to help screen new program initiatives or new ideas for offerings. And this kind of tool making helps others obviously grapple with uncertainty in productive ways. It asks a series of questions to probe key assumptions around degree of need or capacity to, to deliver a new offering, or the ability to capture value by generating revenue or extending impact and reach, or both. Ideally, <laughs> tools like this can also provide an early reality check on the viability and likelihood of success of, uh, of an idea or initiative and triggers possible adjustments to make a new program idea, for example, stronger um, um, by testing before scaling. Continuing on uh, strategy and the upside, increasingly today organizations are turning to innovation, the innovative thinking process to grow their value, impact and reach. I wanted to touch on this area briefly. Uh, innovation experts, Nagy and Tuck, remind organizations that we will wanna spend some time thinking about the level of innovation we desire. And to support this with the uh, you know, corresponding and appropriate resourcing for the right mix of innovation types that will cover our core, uh, which uh, uh, typically um, leads to enhancement type initiatives, and uh, extending our current offerings into adjacent markets, or pursuing transformational breakthrough innovations that involve uh, new offerings in new markets or segments. The authors of this uh, really good read from HBR also suggest there's an interesting inverse ratio that exists when comparing investment and returns across an innova uh, the innovation levels as illustrated here in this graphic. Transformational innovation, of course, is going to involve a lot more risk. But when it's managed effectively, goodness, that payoff really is appealing. So what can we do to help de-risk a new innovative idea or strategic option? Well, turning to a tool or technique for de-risking uh, or probing assumptions, um, there's a technique called reverse engineering uh, developed by Roger Martin, and it helps leaders and teams probe must-be-true conditions for idea or strategy success by asking the question, what would have to be true in order for this idea or strategy to be a good one? Now, it's not what is true, but what would have to be true. For example, what would have to be true about what our members all our members value or want in order for this to be a good idea or strategic option? Or what would have to be true about our own capabilities in order for this to be a good idea or strategic option or choice? Or what would have to be true about what our delivery partners or funders, what they value in order for this to be a good strategic option and so on? If the idea or strategic option does not hold up under this line of questioning, then it's gonna fall on its own. It's a simple yet powerful technique that helps leaders manage uncertainty in a productive, more constructive way. And this technique, uh, um, uh, a technique like reverse engineering, 
will also help, in my mind, to address any blind spots or biases we all carry with us. Here are the 18 cognitive biases that apparently exist and include anchoring bias or confirmation bias or status quo bias that many of us will, will be familiar with, and so on. That can obviously impact, for example, the quality of decision making. And that can give rise, obviously, to uh, associated risks. So cognitive biases, that's an important source of risk for us to be mindful of as leaders. So rounding the bend here down to the last few slides, another option to consider is building our agility muscles. So here's the, the, the touch I promised on agility. We are right, obviously, to be mindful of the big events like a natural disaster or a massive cyber attack. But it is good to keep in mind also that it is often a combination of small failures happening all at once that can cause a larger impact in this increasingly complex and interconnected world we operate in. And while there's not much we can do to simplify systems, frankly, there's probably no going back, we can change our approach to how we manage them. It starts by being more self-aware, for example, knowing when to show up more with a creative versus a reactive mindset as leaders. Obviously, organizations will want to toggle, will want to know and have capabilities in both these mindsets to successfully manage in today's fast-paced reality. Okay, so how do we go about building our creative mindsets? How do we build agility? Well, at the individual leader level, experts will tell us agile leadership uh, has a certain characteristics that here are summed up as uh, leading with discovery or leading with partnering and leading with abundance. I've folded in a simple self-assessment with questions that get at what this can look like, uh, the actions that, that demonstrate ag these agile traits. So we can decide to do this little self-assessment or we can start by just being more aware of when we are doing these things and when we are not and when we see it in others. And this way, uh, uh, it can take us on a journey and others on a, on a discovery of imagining possibilities. So getting to the closing slides here, we have covered a lot of territory here, and I do want to leave some time for questions. So as a takeaway, there's just this uh, summary assessment tool I crafted a while back that captures what has worked for us at the Y to build our own risk capabilities over time. And it may be helpful for other organizations. It covers key elements uh, for building knowledge, people, processes to, to manage risk and opportunities more successfully. This tool can also help organizations determine what areas to focus on first if or when embarking on their own ERM journey. Um, for some quick lessons learned at the intersections here, it really is about finding new ways to engage more people in risk conversations and finding opportunities to weave in or embed risk thinking along the way. And just learning by doing, you know, choosing the two or three things you want to focus on first and building on that. I like to uh, end on a note that uh, is borrowed from, again, the brilliant thinkers, uh, Roger Martin and Aristotle, going way back, who remind us about two parts of the world that exist. There's a part of the world where we believe that things cannot be other than what they are. And in this part of the world, what will serve us well are cause and effect approaches, manage and control measures, data analytics. All of these things will help us improve incrementally over time. Then there's the part of the world where we believe that things can be other than what they are. And in this part of the world, we imagine possibilities and make a compelling argument for the idea or solution we feel most excited about, and then we action it. We learn by doing and adjust. And this really is the only chance uh, we have to dent the universe. So for cherries to thrive, 
will want to uh, be able to manage uh, uncertainty effectively in both worlds to ensure sustained impact well into the future. So I think with that, uh, we're ready for some questions, Marina. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Monica. So I want to start by giving a shout out to all of our friends on the call today who are representing small organizations. I know there's a lot of you out there that, you know, have less than 10 staff, maybe have no staff. Uh, and I, I'm wondering, Monica, if you could maybe uh, speak a little bit to those folks on the call. If you've got a small organization, where's a good place to start considering that your resources are probably pretty strapped? Yeah, such a great question and reality check, you know, um, when resources are are so limited. Um, well, still, though, um, when putting together an annual plan, you're going to ha want to have some sense of what sort of the top concerns, risks, uh, are that are keeping you up at night and what are the big opportunities right that you l will have likely reflected in your plan so that there's that that discussion or dialogue that's happening uh, also with you know at a board level that oversight uh, uh, small mid-size or large uh, we are accountable uh, to our communities to our board uh, there will be uh, governance structures in place and a uh, risk management process is, is really an invitation then uh, for those conversations to happen uh, to make sure we haven't missed any of the big, big things. So uh, maybe just going through, a, okay, here's what we want to achieve. Now let's, if it's a 10 person team, if it's a three-person senior team, um, wh what do we feel are the big concerns uh, and uh, what, what's exciting us most that, that we, that's reflected in this plan? We call that out so that we're making sure that when we're deciding the budget, we are investing in those, those big things that really matter. And there is just a practical kind of, you know, if nothing else, you just want to understand what's going to get in the way of achieving what you desire. I, I would start there and then build on that. You know, you might agree on what do we understand by risk? What do we understand by opportunity? What are the top? Is it five? Is it 10? I wouldn't go beyond that, right? Just getting started at the high level. That's great, Monica. And we had a few folks also calling out uh, how much they appreciated you having those three phases that kind of chunk things out for people to get started. Yeah. So that's great yeah. as well. Um, okay, here's a great question. Is there a common sector-wide risk that is keeping board members up at night? <laughs> well, for charities, among your top 10, typically you're going to find reputation brand, you're going to find people, you're going to find technology, you're going to find a very, it may not be called resource allocation and capacity, but that resource question that you asked previously will somehow, you know, uh, uh, surface among, uh, among top 10. And also many charities will work with vulnerable populations, so child protection, vulnerable adults, right? Um, those are um, common entries in top risk, uh, in uh, top risk rankings for charities I, I've seen. Oh, that's, that, those are all, all very good ones, ones that we hear about a lot as well. Um, right. th this is a, another really great question. So when would risks drive strategy versus informing strategy? Risks will drive strategy when strategy is actually not done well. <laughs> I, think, I think Roger <laughs> Martin will, 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 uh, will agree with me. You, you, don't, you don't hold back on your mission and your vision uh, uh, because of uh, fear. 
um, that aspiration, you know, there's a, I didn't include it, um, and it could be a session all on its own, you know, strategy, the strategy risk interplay. That's a whole session on its own. I might, uh, I might offer up that idea, Marina. Um, but you really want to start off with, you know, your North Star, that aspiration, what the, the, the impact uh, we desire. And then uh, consider uh, the heart of any strategy, good strategy, the how and where um, uh, we will have impact. And then into the supporting capabilities required uh, just to deliver on the how and where choices. And then into your systems. What I've actually described is uh, the strategic um, uh, choice cast. Uh, again, uh, uh, another uh, wonderful framework from uh, Roger Martin. I think that is a separate uh, <laughs> seminar, though, or, or webcast. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, great, great, uh, wicked question, uh, and hope that's helpful. That's great. So we, we've already got some planning for some future sessions. That's great. Well, I think we're going to cap things there, Monica, just because we're at the end uh, of our time. Uh, did you have any last words you wanted to, to leave folks with? Mm -hmm. That risk is fun. It's, uh, you know, there's a lot to soak in. Um, when we understand uh, the two sides of the risk coin, um, the possibilities are limitless. Um, so jump in, decide uh, the one, two, three things you want to knock off uh, in year one and build on that. It's a great journey. Well, that's great. Well, thank you so much, Monica. You gave us a lot to think about in this session um, and such a, a jam-packed slide deck as well. So I want to remind everyone that we are going to follow up with you by email with the webinar recording and that full slide deck. So you can go back and take a look at some of those um, amazing diagrams and, and charts that Monica had. You'll likely get that email later today or by first thing tomorrow morning. Uh, there will also be a short survey there that's going to take less than five minutes for you to fill out. So we hope that you'll complete that for us if you can. And uh, there is, as always, an opportunity there to let us know if there's other topics you'd like to see covered in a future session. Uh, on April 4th, we are offering a special free webinar in collaboration with the Ontario Nonprofit Network. We're going to be discussing in detail their Decent Work Initiative for women working in Ontario's nonprofit sector. And for those of you outside of Ontario, um, I have chatted with the presenter about this, and she is very confident that their findings are actually um, applicable across Canada and even internationally. So you may still want to join that session. There will be a link to register in the email that you receive later today or tomorrow. And uh, with that, I'm going to thank you all for joining us today. I hope that we'll see you again at a future session. Thank you so much.